I remember the day I met Jack as if it was yesterday. I was sitting in a small, cozy cafe, drinking the cheapest coffee they offered and trying to organize my thoughts and plans. Then he walked in, like something out of a movie, though there were no dramatic lights or music, just the sound of the bell over the door and the scent of old coffee mixed with his aftershave. Is this seat taken? he asked, pointing to the chair opposite me with a charming smile. Looks free to me, I replied, trying to act cool and not show how surprised I was by his sudden arrival. We started chatting, and it felt like we were made for each other. He liked all the same things I did, from binge-watching the same cheesy TV shows to debating the best pizza topping and yes, it's pineapple, fight me on it. Soon, we were dating seriously, not just hanging out now and then, it was like I'd known him all my life. Before long, we were even talking about marriage. That's when the trouble started. His parents, let me tell you, were tough to deal with. The first time I met them, it felt like walking into a lion's den wearing a steak. They had a way of smiling while sizing you up, deciding if you were good enough or not. So you're the girl Jack can't stop talking about, his mom said, her tone anything but friendly. Guilty as charged, I replied, trying not to let her get to me. They quickly made it clear they wanted us to sign a prenuptial agreement. Now, I'm not after anyone's money, but I didn't like how they approached it. I'll sign your prenup, I told them, but on one condition. If one of us cheats, the cheater has to pay up $200,000. Jack looked as if I'd hit him with a fish. Babe, I'd never cheat on you, he said, looking serious. Yeah, well, my ex said the same thing before I caught him cheating, I said. So it was this deal or nothing. He agreed, and so did his parents, although they looked pretty sour about it. We thought that was the end of that issue, but we were wrong. One evening, we were snuggled up on our old creaky couch. We kept saying we'd replace it, but never did because it was our special spot. The TV was on, but we weren't really watching. We were too excited. Planning a trip to Switzerland, we knew we couldn't really afford, but were determined to make happen. Think about it, Jack. The food, the wine, the art. We have to go, I said, my eyes lit up with excitement. Jack laughed and hugged me closer. Linda, you had me at food, but let's be real. Our bank account is more suited for camping in the backyard than a romantic trip to Lausanne. I nudged him playfully. So we'll save. We'll cut back on things we don't need, like your video games. He pretended to be shocked. Not the video games. Take my shirts, my shoes, even my beloved coffee maker, but leave the games alone. We laughed together. That was typical for us, dreaming big but staying realistic about our simple life. And we were happy. Our joy wasn't just in big adventures, it was in the little things too, like how Jack would make breakfast on Saturdays. He couldn't really cook, but he had somehow mastered scrambled eggs and toast, which he'd serve with his terrible coffee. I loved those mornings. Hey, I'm thinking scrambled eggs today. What do you think? He'd ask, already heading to the kitchen. Only if you promise not to burn the toast this time. I'd shout back, adding, and I'm making the coffee. One day, while we were washing dishes together, a simple task that felt special because we did it together, Jack brought up a topic we had been avoiding. Linda, we need to talk about, you know, starting a family, he said, breaking the comfortable silence. I paused, holding a plate. I know, it's just scary, isn't it? What if we can't? Jack turned to me drying his hands on a towel. Then we'll handle it together, but we won't know until we try, right? How hard can it be? I laughed, feeling a mix of nerves and love. Famous last words, babe. But that's how we were. No matter what came our way, we faced it together. Even when his mom started hinting about wanting grandchildren, every chance she got, we managed. Linda, darling, when are you going to give me some grandbabies? You're not getting any younger, you know, she'd say. Her tone was sweet, but her words were sharp. I just bite my tongue, smile, and say, We're working on it, aren't we, Jack? And he'd jump in, Yeah, Mom, 
Give it a rest, will you? These things take time. But as the year went on, the pressure increased. It wasn't just from his mom, but from within us too. We wanted a family, but it wasn't happening as easily as we hoped. Since Sophia found her new hobby of making my life difficult, our home felt like a battleground, her sharp words the main weapon. It all came to a head one Sunday lunch, a day meant to be relaxed and peaceful. Sophia, with her usual timing, dropped by uninvited just as we were about to sit down. The air tensed the moment she walked in, her eyes scanning the room as if she was about to conduct a military inspection. Well, isn't this quaint, she started, her voice dripping with sarcasm as she looked at the simple meal I prepared. You really outed yourself, Linda. I can see you've been busy in the kitchen all morning. Her eyes met mine briefly, a smirk on her lips. Trying to keep the peace, I forced a smile. It's nothing fancy, Sophia, just something simple and quick. Please have a seat. As we sat down, she began her usual tirade. You know, Linda, Sophia said, her voice loaded with condescension. I was talking to Mrs. Charlotte the other day, and she mentioned how her grandson was just born. It got me thinking, when are you and Jack going to give me some good news? You're not getting any younger. I felt my cheeks burn with a mix of embarrassment and anger. I glanced at Jack, hoping for some support, but he seemed suddenly very interested in his plate. Mom, come on, Jack finally muttered, but it was half-hearted, and we all knew it. Sophia continued, relentless. I don't mean to be harsh, but you're not a charity. You work hard for your money. Why waste it on Linda if she can't do her basic duties as a wife? Hiring a cleaning service and a cook would be much more efficient, don't you think? That's when I couldn't hold back any longer. Sophia, I am trying my best here. It's not like I don't want to have kids. And as for the house and my cooking, I didn't realize marriage was a service contract. Sophia scoffed. Well, it's not a free ride either. You have responsibilities, Linda, which you're clearly not fulfilling. The room was thick with tension, and I could feel tears starting to form. But what hurt the most wasn't Sophia's words, it was Jack's silence. He finally spoke up, but it wasn't to defend me. Yeah, Mom has a point. Maybe we should consider getting some help around here. It would make things easier for you, too. His words felt like a betrayal. It was clear I was on my own. Over the next few days, Sophia's visits became more frequent, and with each visit, her criticism got sharper. She'd inspect the house, pointing out every speck of dust or a pillow out of place. You call this clean? She'd scoff. My eyes must be deceiving me because this looks like a pigsty. Then came the comments about my appearance. Is that what you're wearing? You know, a wife should dress to please her husband. It's no wonder Jack is always so tired. He has to come home to this. I tried to fight back. Sophia, I don't dress for Jack. I dress for myself. And he's tired because he works hard, not because of what I wear. But it was like talking to a brick wall. Sophia had made up her mind about me, and nothing I said or did would change it. Jack's lack of support was the biggest blow. Each night after his mom left, we'd argue. Why won't you stand up for me, Jack? She's walking all over us, and you're just letting her. Linda, she's old and set in her ways. What do you want me to do, kick my own mom out? No, but I want you to be my husband, to stand by me, not her. It was clear this was about more than just Sophia's disapproval. It was about us, our marriage, and whether we were strong enough to stand together or let Sophia's criticisms tear us apart as the days turned into weeks. I realized this wasn't just a temporary issue, it was a full-on attack, and if we didn't act soon, there might not be anything left to save. Things between me and Jack had been cold since Sophia intensified her criticisms. But it wasn't just our home life that was under pressure. Jack himself had started acting strange, and it wasn't just because he was stressed at work. It was something more, something that made my stomach churn. It began with phone calls. Jack used to be open about his phone. We didn't keep secrets from each other. 
But then he started leaving the room whenever he got a call, and it was always the same caller ID. Paul Work. One evening, I tried to sound casual and asked, Who's Paul Work? Jack flinched, a clear sign he was nervous. Oh, just a new guy at the office, asks a lot of questions, he said. But there was more. Jack, who was never into fashion, suddenly started caring about how he looked. The graphic tees and old jeans were gone, replaced by crisp shirts, slacks, and even cologne. Since when did you start caring about smelling like a department store? I joked one morning as I watched him comb his hair in a new style. He just smirked too quickly, just felt like changing things up. No harm in that, right? And then there were the late nights at work, which became more frequent. Another long one, babe? I texted, trying not to sound needy. Sorry, this project is killing me. Won't be late, I promise, he texted back. But it would be well past midnight before I'd hear his keys in the door. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong, it followed me like a shadow. That's when I decided to hire a private detective. It felt like something from a cheesy TV show, but I had to know for sure. The evidence came in a plain brown envelope, as heartbreaking as it was conclusive. Photos of Jack with another woman, their closeness unmistakable, caught in moments that shattered our years together. But it was the recording that hurt the most their conversations, filled with affection and plans, made it clear. They were in love, or at least he was with her. I sat there with the evidence laid out in front of me, feeling a cold realization. This was the proof I might need if we ended up in a tough divorce. The photos captured moments stolen from our life together. And the recorded words betrayed every I love you he had ever whispered in my ear. But I kept it all to myself, a painful burden I chose to bear alone. I wasn't ready to confront him, not yet. I needed a plan, a way to handle the collapse of our marriage while keeping my dignity. The following days passed in a blur. Jack kept up his act, and I played the role of the perfect wife, smiling on the outside while breaking inside. Our conversations became a careful dance around the truth, each word measured, every laugh forced. Everything okay, M? You've been quiet, Jack would ask, his concern sounding real. Yeah, just tired, you know. Work's been crazy, I'd reply, the lie bitter in my mouth. It was just another ordinary day, or so I thought, until I overheard a conversation that changed everything. I was passing by Jack's office, the door slightly open, when I heard their voices. It was Jack and his mother, Sophia, and they weren't just making small talk. Their tone was serious, full of intent. I'm telling you, Mom, I can't do this anymore. It's not just about the kids. I've lost all feelings for Linda. It feels like we're roommates, not husband and wife, Jack said, his voice strained and tired. Sophia's response was sharp. Of course you feel that way. She hasn't given you a child. And what else has she really brought to this marriage? But let's not rush things. My 65 birthday is coming up and we wouldn't want to miss out on a generous gift from her, would we? The cynicism in her voice was like a knife twisting in my gut. They were using me, planning to keep me around just long enough to benefit from a generous birthday gift before casting me aside. Exactly, dear. Just bide your time a little longer, Sophia confirmed, her voice dripping with malice. I stood there, frozen, feeling both shocked and angry. They were planning to push me out of the family as easily as making a grocery list. The pain was deep, but it ignited a fierce desire for revenge within me. They thought they could use me and toss me aside when convenient. I was determined to show them that I wasn't just a pawn in their twisted game. A few days later, during a family dinner that felt more like an act than a meal, Sophia brought up her upcoming birthday with a smirk I had grown to hate. She leaned in and asked, So Linda, dear, what are you planning for my birthday? Something special, I hope. I looked at her calmly and said, Actually, Sophia, I was thinking of hosting a dinner at the city's most luxurious restaurant a night you won't forget. Her eyes lit up with greed, and she shared a quick, satisfied glance with Jack. They thought they had cornered me, but they didn't know I was already two steps ahead. 
Oh, Linda, that sounds delightful. Just close family, you know? Keep it intimate, Sophia said, her voice dripping with fake sweetness. Of course, Sophia, it'll be our pleasure, I replied, the words tasting bitter in my mouth. The weeks leading up to Sophia's 65th birthday felt like a slow march to a big showdown. Every smirk from her and every indifferent shrug from Jack strengthened my determination. My plan was simple yet bold, host a lavish dinner as a supposed loving gesture, then drop a huge surprise. Like all good plans, the details were crucial. The night before the party, tension filled our home. Jack, unaware of the brewing storm, lounged casually on the couch, scrolling through his phone. Everything set for tomorrow? He asked, not looking up. You could say that, I replied, my voice hiding the chaos inside. The day arrived, and as guests filled the lavish dining room we had reserved for Sophia's celebration, the air was thick with anticipation. My heart raced, not from nerves, but from the thrill of what was about to happen. Sophia, reveling in the attention, basked in the luxury of her surroundings. Oh, Linda, you've outdone yourself. This place is exquisite, she exclaimed loudly enough for nearby tables to hear. As we all settled in, the meal went on with the kind of strange cheer typical of such family events. Laughs were shared, stories exchanged. Then, as the dessert plates were cleared, the waiter approached with the final act of the evening the bill. He leaned in discreetly and informed us the dinner cost was $66,000. I handed over my credit card, unnoticed by most. Then Jack, with a forced smirk, decided to announce his decision. Linda, I think it's time everyone knew. I'm tired of this, of us. I want a divorce. His words hung in the air like a toxic cloud, silencing the room. Before I could fully grasp what, he said, Sophia, sharp and unforgiving, chimed in. Well then, since that's out of the open, I think it's best you leave, Linda. We're celebrating family tonight, and well, you're no longer part of it. The room fell silent, every eye on me, waiting to see my reaction. But I didn't crumble. With a calm I didn't feel, I stood up, nodded, and walked out without a word. The cool night air felt like a slap as I walked home, the finality of everything hitting me in waves. By the time I reached Arnaud, his apartment, I had a plan. I packed my essentials, my numbness turning into cold resolve. This was it, the end of one life and the start of another. As I zipped up my last suitcase, my phone began to buzz. It was relentless, and I initially ignored it. But curiosity won, and Sophia's voice shrieked from the other end. Linda, the payment didn't go through. You need to fix this now. The irony was sweet. In my preparations, I had blocked the shared account, knowing it would be the first thing Jack would try to use against me. Oh, Sophia, that's unfortunate. But since I'm no longer part of the family, as you put it, I'm afraid you'll have to sort this out yourself. Her outrage was palpable even through the phone, but it sounded like music to my ears. The chaos that unfolded was a fitting end to the farce my marriage had become. I heard through the grapevine about the restaurant staff demanding payment, Sophia's escalating tantrums, and eventually the police arriving to calm the situation she caused. In the end, it was Jack and his relatives who had to scrape together the money to settle the bill a poetic justice for the betrayal and humiliation they had put me through. The morning after the dinner felt like waking up after a storm. I had my plan, my resolve, and a set of divorce papers in my hand as I returned to what used to be our shared home for the last time. As soon as I walked through the door, the air was thick with tension, like it could be cut with a knife. Jack and Sophia were there, and they seemed like they had been arguing. Seeing me seemed to unite them in anger. You've got some nerve showing up here after last night, Jack said, his face a mix of anger and disbelief. Sophia, quick to add her own harsh words, called out, ungrateful wretch. You've embarrassed us in front of the whole city. Do you know how humiliating it was to have the police call me down? People were laughing, filming. I met their fury with a calm I didn't feel. Embarrassed? You think that's your biggest problem right now? 
I toss the divorce papers on the table, placing the photos of Jack's infidelity on top. You should be more worried about this. Jack's face went pale as he picked up the photos, with his mother looking over his shoulder. Their anger turned to shock, and then to panic as they realized what I had. And let's not forget the print-up, shall we? I continued, my voice steady. You cheat, you pay, $200,000, to be exact. Sophia's face twisted into a snarl. You wouldn't dare, you can't do this to us. Oh, but I can, and I will, I replied, my tone cold and final. Realizing the seriousness of the situation, Jack changed his approach. Em, please, let's talk about this, we can fix it. I couldn't help but laugh, bitter and hard. Fix it? You think you can just undo everything with a few words? No, Jack, it's done. Sophia, ever the manipulator, tried to soften her approach, her voice full of fake concern. Linda, darling, think about what you're doing. This will ruin us. That ship has sailed, Sophia. You should have thought about that before. Their begging turned to pleading, their words a desperate scramble to salvage what they could, but my mind was made up. I was done being the victim, done with their lies and manipulations. In the end, Jack had no choice but to borrow the money from his parents to pay me. As I left that house for the last time, check in hand, I felt a weight lift off my shoulders. After everything that had happened, I was finally free. I used the money from Jack to make a down payment on a small but cozy place of my own. It's amazing how much peace you can find in a home that's all yours, where every corner feels like a safe haven from the chaos of the past. Life is quieter now, and I prefer it that way. I've got a job that keeps me busy, friendly neighbors who nod and smile, and a little garden that's all mine to take care of. But every now and then, I hear some gossip about Jack and Sophia. Just the other day, I was getting coffee from the local spot where people gather, and I bumped into someone from the old neighborhood. After some small talk, they leaned in, lowered their voice, and said, Hey, have you heard the latest drama with your ex and his mom? Their eyes were shining with excitement. I raised an eyebrow, curious yet detached. Can't say that I have, do tell. They seemed to enjoy sharing the news. It seems Sophia isn't too happy with Jack's new girlfriend. Word is, they're fighting like cats and dogs. Makes your situation look like a walk in the park. We moved on from the topic, but as I walked away with my coffee, I felt a deep sense of relief. There was a time when news like this would have upset me, but now it's just another piece of someone else's story. These days, my biggest concerns are whether my tomatoes will ripen before the squirrels get to them, or if I'll ever manage yoga without looking like a newborn deer on ice. Life's simpler, quieter, and so much sweeter on this side of chaos.